So last week we, uh, we had the introduction as to the scene of the Day of Judgment and everyone rushing to their place to stand where they will stand, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has decreed for them to stand. As we mentioned, there are those that are on the right side, those on the left side, and then there are al-muqarrabun, those who are close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and they're away from you know all of that, uh, from the sun, they're completely shaded, they're completely protected. And we mentioned that there are multiple categories. But the Prophet ﷺ repeated the hadith of the seven over 30 times. Okay, so these seven categories are certainly, you know, special seven categories. And Rasulullah ﷺ has repeated them multiple times. And um, with that being said, the books that were written about this hadith, so just for those that are taking notes, especially online, the books that were written on this hadith, they had four in particular. They had a book by Imam Al-Qasqalani, Imam Ibn Hajar Al-Asqalani, Imam Al-Sakhawi, and an Imam al suyuti So these four great scholars of Islam have compiled entire collections going through all of the categories that are mentioned in the hadith, the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. Some of them compiled 40 categories, some compiled 60. And Imam al sakhawi actually compiled about 92 or 94 uh, categories that are mentioned from the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ about people in the shade of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But because this hadith of the seven was mentioned multiple times, that's why the ulama focus on this particular hadith. And what's interesting about this hadith, just some observations about the seven that are in the shade of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is that these seven categories cover each and every single person in society. Meaning everyone can strive to become at least one of these categories. So whether you occupy position or you have no position, whether you're young or you're old, whether you're male or you're female, whether you're rich or you're poor, you're poor, you'll find that there are categories within these seven in which each and every single person can strive for it. Perhaps that's the wisdom of the Prophet ﷺ mentioning these seven in particular. And whenever we, we'll go briefly over the, the other categories, inshallah ta'ala, in the fourth lecture, you find that they're really offshoots of these behaviors that are mentioned in these seven categories. So you can, you know, you can strive for each one. Also interesting about this hadith is that it starts off each and every single one of these times because the seven categories, sometimes the Prophet ﷺ mentions them in different sequences. But it's always Imam Adil. The first one is always a just ruler. And that's where you have the most heavy writing about the just ruler. So it starts off with someone who's you know, in, in, in uh, ultimate power in this world, who rules society, who's in, a, in, in the capacity of a ruler. And it goes all the way down to a person that remembers Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the privacy of his room and sheds a tear. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shades him for that reason. So you can see where it's going from the top all the way to the bottom, from complete you know, public service to a complete private service between the servant and his Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala in his room, crying and mentioning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you know, an Imam al Sahawi rahimahullah, he said that there's a clear sequence uh, of what the Prophet is mentioning. So, for example, he said, first and foremost, it starts with a just ruler. When a society tends to not have a just ruler, it tends to deflate that entire society. It tends to increase financial corruption. It increases moral corruption. And all we have to do is look at the Muslim world today, right? When you have a dictator that's in charge and financial corruption, the entire society is affected by that. So it starts off with a just ruler. And whenever you have a just ruler, it makes way for young people, which is the second category, young people who grow up worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when young people grow up worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, where are they drawn to? The masajid. And when they come to the masajid, which is the third category, who do they meet? Their brothers for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So they love one another for no other reason but the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then through that, he gains a sense of taqwa. So whenever that person is tested outside, which is the fifth category, where he's called by a woman of, of, of great status and beauty, or a woman is called by a man of great status and beauty, he stops and he says, Inni akhaf Allah, I fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he also finds it very easily to give charity in his private moments, which is the sixth category. And lastly, 
what we, can, what, we, what we see in these categories is that the first four categories regard your public life, the last three categories are in regards to your private life. Meaning, if you fix your public life for the sake of Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will also help you in fixing your private life. Okay? And you can summarize that with what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِلَّا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ وَتَوَاصَوْ بِالْحَقِّ وَتَوَاصَوْ بِالصَّالِحِ Except for those who believe and work righteous deeds, وَتَوَاصَوْ بِالْحَقِّ And then they support one another in truth and in patience. So half of the deen is for you, half of the deen is to benefit those around you as well. Now here's a question, a very beautiful question. And this is narrated by Imam al-Sayyuti rahimahullah ta'ala. He said all of the prophets fall into some of these categories. And some of the prophets have multiple categories under their belt. Some of them, and the Prophet ﷺ has the majority of them, for example. But there is one man in the history of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's creation that is confirmed to fall into all seven of these categories. Does anyone know who it is? Think about a prophet. Who is it? Not Ibrahim ﷺ. Yusuf Yusuf ﷺ. The Prophet Yusuf ﷺ. From first category to last category. He is a just ruler. He grew up in the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He was called by a beautiful woman. He gave he was a generous man. He was someone who used to cry in his alone moments. The point is, all seven of the categories, Yusuf alayhi salam fits into each one of them. Now let's start off with the first category that's mentioned here. Imamun Adil, a just ruler. So again, many, many versions of this hadith where the Prophet mentioned some of the categories slightly out of sequence, but Imamun Adil, the just ruler is always the first one. Why? Some of the ulama, they say, because of his virtue and his closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is narrated by Abu Sa'id al-Khudri radhi Allah ta'ala anhu in Sunnah Tirmidhi with an authentic hadith, إِنَّ أَحَبَّ النَّاسِ إِلَى اللَّهِ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ وَأَدْنَاهُ مِنْهُ مَجْلِسَ That the most beloved of people to Allah on the Day of Judgment and the closest of them to him in regards to his station, in regards to uh, where he will, he will stand, Imamun Adil is a just ruler. Uh, and the most hated of people to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, minhu majlisa Imamun Jabir. And the most hated person to Allah and the furthest from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day of judgment was a tyrant, is a tyrant. Why? Because the first rule of the day of judgment as the Prophet ﷺ taught us, is adlun tam, perfect justice. So those who were just are closest to Allah and most beloved to Allah. And if you remember last week, we said that there's a period of the Day of Judgment where you're standing under the sun, and then all of a sudden, the lights go out. And the same categories of people that are mentioned as being shaded by Allah's throne when the sun is up, are the same people that are mentioned as having nur, as having light when the lights go out. And particularly now, with the just ruler, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said in an authentic hadith in Sahih Muslim, إِنَّ الْمُقْصِدِينَ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ عَلَى مَنَابِرَ مِنْ نُورِ That the just in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or the just rulers, the just people, actually the muqsateen here, people of justice is not specified to rulers, it's not exclusive to rulers here. But those people who are just will not only have nur on the Day of Judgment, Rasulullah said they will have pulpits of light عَنْ يَمِينَ rahman to the right of the Most Merciful. So subhanAllah, Allah Azza wa will actually give them manabir, Allah will give them a manbab, a pulpit of nur. So some of the ulama, they say the reason why the Prophet ﷺ always mentions the Sultan, the Imam al-Adil, the righteous ruler first, and the just ruler first, is because he's the best of those seven categories. Some of them say, because if the ruler is just, the other six categories are more likely to happen. What we just mentioned in the beginning of the lecture. When you have a just ruler, the masajid are open, the youth are attracted to the masjid. If the ruler is not corrupt, the people are less likely to be corrupt. So all of these categories are more likely to happen. And Imam Sufyan al-Thawri rahimahullah, he has a very interesting statement in that regard. He says, Sanfani min al-Nas. He said, there are two groups of people. Ida saluha, if they are righteous, saluhat al-Ummah, then the entire Ummah is righteous. Wa ida fasada, fasadat al-Ummah. And if those two groups of people are corrupt, then the entire ummah will be corrupt, he said, al-muluk wal-ulama, the rulers and the scholars. If those two groups amongst the ummah are righteous, everyone else is righteous. If those two groups become corrupt, everyone else becomes corrupt. 
And look at Bani Israel. When did Bani Israel go wrong? That's exactly when. Their rabbis, their scholars were cor became corrupt. Their kings became corrupt. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes their ulama. مَثَلُ الَّذِينَ حَمِّلُوا تَوْرَاتُ ثُمَّ لَمْ يَحْمِلُوهَا كَمَثَلِ الْحِمَارِ يَحْمِلُوا أَسْفَالًا He describes their scholars as donkeys that were carrying books on their backs, meaning none of it was internalized. And their kings started to use the corrupt scholars this sounds familiar, right, in the Muslim world today. They used their corrupt scholars to make fatwas for them, to give them the right to do whatever they wanted to do. Yahya was killed because he refused to give the king what he wanted to hear. Right? So the king had, you know, the kings had their ulama, they had their scholars, the scholars said whatever they wanted them to do, they were taken care of as a result. They justified everything for them. So if those two groups of people are corrupt, corruption is widespread in the ummah. If those two groups of people are righteous, then righteousness is, is more likely in the ummah. And that's why the Prophet ﷺ, when he was, you know, one time there was a woman, this is in Bukhari, that was, you know, from the, from the royals. She was of elite status, mansab. She had, she had a great status in society. And she committed theft. And the Prophet ﷺ, uh, you know, said that the had was going to be carried on her, the punishment for theft was going to be carried on her. So some of the Sahaba, this is early on in Islam, they talk to Usama bin Zayd because they know Usama bin Zayd is close to the Prophet They said to Usama, can you go talk to the Prophet and say, look, this woman is, is a really, you know, she's, she's a rich woman, she's high in society, she's high in status, you know, can, can you not, can you spare her from being punished for her theft? So Usama came to the Prophet and Rasulullah he responded and he said that Bani Israel was such that if someone who was rich and of status stole, then they get away with it. But if someone was poor, then they willingly applied the punishment to someone who was poor. And he said, Wallahi, the Prophet said, if Fatima bintu Muhammad, if Fatima, my daughter, radiallahu ta'ala anha wa alayhi salatu wasalam, was to steal, then I would enforce the punishment upon her. So we are not like that. That's not our ummah. We are an ummah of complete justice with no matter who it may be. And that's why um, Abu Hurairah radiallahu ta'ala anha, he said the Prophet was once addressing the Sahaba, this is in Al-Bukhari, and an Arabi man, a Bedouin man came through, and he said to Rasulullah Mata Sa'a, when is the hour? And the Prophet he tended to respond to different people with different answers. So when is the hour? And the Prophet this time, he said, Aina Sa'idu an Sa'a. After the lecture said, Where is the one who asked about the hour? So they showed him who it was. The Prophet said, Whenever the trust is lost, then you can expect the hour, expect the day of judgment. Very, very, very soon. They said, وَكَيْفَ إِضَاعَتُهَا يَا رَسُولُ اللَّهِ How can amana, how can trust be lost? Two narrations. One time the Prophet ﷺ said, أَنْ يُوَلَّ الْأَمْرَ غَيْرَ أَهْلِ That leadership is given to those that don't deserve it. Another time the Prophet ﷺ addressed the ulama. He said, بِمَوْتِ الْعُلَمَاء With the death of the scholars. So whenever the scholars die, he said, اِتَّخَذَ النَّاسَ رُؤُسًا جُهَانَ The people will take ignorant people as their leaders. وَسُعِدُوا And they will be asked, فَأَفْتُوا بِغَيْرِ عِلْمِ And they would give fatwa without any knowledge, فَضَلُّوا وَأَضَلُّوا They would go astray and they would lead everyone else astray. So proving the statement of Sufyan al-Thawri رَحِمَهُ اللَّهُ تَعَالَى In the Qur'an, we find that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, describing the, the role of the messengers, He says to Dawood alayhi salam, that we made you, uh, a, we, we, you know, we made you a Khalifa in this earth so that you could establish justice. And he says about the messengers that they would that they would enforce the people with al qist that they would enforce society with justice. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala gave that mission to each and every single one of the believers. He says Subhanahu wa Taala, Ya ayyuha al-ladina amanu kunu qawamina bil qist shuhada alilla wala wa ala anfusikum. And until the end of the ayah, O oh, you who believe. Be persistently standing firm in justice. Witnesses for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, even against yourselves, your parents, your relatives, whether they're rich, whether they're poor, each and every single one of the believers is, has a responsibility of justice. Allah Azza wa says that if two groups of people get into a fight, فَأَصْلِحُ بَيْنَهُمَا And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, you know, bring them together, re reconcile between them. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Bil Adli wa right? Later on in the ayah that you should do them justice. 
and, and you know, bring them together on the basis of justice. Inna Allah ya'muru bil adli wal ihsan. Allah enjoins you with justice and compassion. Inna Allah yuhibbu al You know, I'm not going to go any further than that in the ayat. But Allah loves the just. Allah says in the Quran various times that He loves people of justice. Now, what is the meaning of the word adil in the Arabic language? The word justice in the Arabic language. Adil in the Arabic language means an tu'addil hubu, that you give everyone their right. It comes from the word al-idl. Al-idl means to distribute the weights fairly. Okay? So to distribute the weights in a fair way. Um, so an Imam ibn Hajar rahimahullah ta'ala, he said, Al-Imam al-Adil, huwa alladhi yatba'u amr Allah, that the just ruler is the one who follows the command of Allah, wa yada'u kulli shayhi fi mawdi'i. And he puts everything in its place. He gives everyone their right and he puts everyone in its, in everything in its place. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brought al-adil, the concept of justice, along with tawheed. So when Allah revealed the verses of monotheism, he also revealed verses concerning social justice from the very early days of Islam. And in fact, Allah calls shirk, which is polytheism, inna shirka dhulmun azim. Shirk is the greatest transgression of them all. Why? Because you don't give Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala his right, which is the right to be worshipped and the right to be obeyed. In fact, you don't even give him recognition with shirk. So inna shirka, shirk is the greatest form of oppression and transgression. But subhanAllah, if you look early on in the revelations of the Qur'an, the first revelations, When the young girl that was buried alive is asked, why were you killed? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala addresses economic transgression and injustice, right? People that cheat with the weights and with the scales. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed Surah Al-Rahman, it's a Makki Surah. Right, so before any of the rulings were set down, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala incorporated in the early message to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Al-Adl, and Allah azza wa jal, He says in the hadith Qudsi, Ya ibadi inni haramtu dhulma ala nafsi, wa ja'altuhu baynakum muharrama fala tadhalam. O my servants, I have made dhul, transgression, oppression, haram for myself. Meaning what? If there is anyone that could, you know, do whatever he wanted to, it's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If Allah wanted to wrong us or oppress us, could anyone tell Allah, no? Are you going to get the United Nations to, to put sanctions? You can't do it. Not that that works anyway. But you can't, you know, you can't do anything with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If Allah azza wa jal wanted to punish us, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted to just to, to wrong us, then Allah azza wa jal is, is qadirun ala kulli shay. He is al qadir He has all power. No one can stop him. But he says, إِنِّي حَرَامْتُ الظُّلْمَ عَلَى نَفْسِي I've made transgression haram for myself. No one else can make anything haram for Allah. And he said, وَجَعَلْتُهُ بَيْنَكُمْ مُحَرَّمًا And I made it between you haram as well. فَلَا تَظَالَمُوا So do not transgress one another. And Allah Azza wa Jalla says, وَلَقَدْ أَهْلَكْنَا الْقُرُونَ That we have destroyed those that came before you. مِنْ قَبْلِكُمْ We destroyed those nations. لَمَّا ظَلَمُوا Whenever they transgressed, if you look at the punishment that came upon the nations before, it didn't usually come down to them just with their shirk. It came down to them when they humiliated the Prophet, they harassed him, they tried to kill him, sometimes they did kill him, they ran him out. That's usually whenever the punishment came from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upon them. You don't find Allah Azza wa Jalla destroying nations in the past just by virtue of their shirk. It's whenever they became aggressive, as Imam Al-Qayyim rahimahullah said, when they became aggressive, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent His destruction upon them. Right? And Imam Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah, he says in that regard something very interesting. He says, Inna Allah liyuqimu dawlat al-adil. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will establish a just nation. Wa in kanat kafirah, even if it's a disbelieving nation. وَيَهْدِمُ دَوْلَةَ اللَّهِ And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will destroy a transgressing nation وَإِنْ كَانَتْ مُسْلِمًا Even if it's a Muslim nation. How amazing is that statement? Even, it's, even beyond shirk and iman, Allah will destroy a nation that is unjust and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will preserve a nation that is just. And the Messenger sallallahu he said to us in a hadith from Abdullah ibn Abi, Abi Awf the Prophet sallallahu said this hadith is in a timidity إن الله مع القاضي الله سبحانه وتعالى is with the judge ما لم يجوب as long as he is not unjust فإذا جاء تخلى عنه 
Allah, so if he becomes unjust, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala leaves him. وَلَزِمَهُ الشَّيْطَانِ And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes him an ally of shaytan. So Allah is with the just ruler. And you know, that brings us to the question, can a kafir, can a, can a disbeliever be just? Can a disbeliever be just? Yes. Yes. Obviously he's not just with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he's not necessarily, you know, he can't be from those who are under the shade of Allah's throne on the Day of Judgment because Iman is the first category that you need to have, right? You have to be at least from Ashabul Yameen, the people of the right side. However, the Prophet ﷺ, when he sent the first group of Muslims to Habasha, to Abyssinia, what did he say, alayhi salatu wasalam? That go over there because you have Malikan Adil. You have a just king in Habasha. And he's not going to accept a dhulm. He's not going to accept transgression. And the Prophet ﷺ, he also said, so that's with the disbeliever, Rasulullah also said that when Isa ﷺ comes down to us, in the hadith in Bukhari from Abu Huraira, that the, the, the hour will not come until Isa ibn Maryam comes, not as a prophet, not as a messenger, hakaman muqsitan wa imaman adil. He will come as a just ruler and a just imam. Okay, so that, that's what Isa's position is when he comes. So it's, it shows you that position in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Also, when it comes to a dua, Rasulullah says an authentic hadith from Abu Huraira in a Tirmidhi that there are three people whose dua is not turned away. Al Imam al Adil is the first one. The just ruler, when he makes dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah answers his dua, وَالصَّائِمُ حَتَّى يُفْطِرُ And the fasting person until he breaks his fast, وَدِعْوَةُ الْمَظْرُومِ And the dua, the dua of the one who is being oppressed. And the Prophet ﷺ said, that dua goes to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala responds and he says, وَيَقُولُ بِعِزَّةِ لَأَنصُرَنَّكِ وَلَوْ بَعْدَ حِينَ by my glory, Allah swears by His glory, I will answer you even if after a little while. Don't think that these du'as go unheard of the mafroom. The Prophet said, again, this even goes beyond the issue of iman. Now think about this, two of these three categories have to do with justice. But the Prophet said in another hadith from Ahmad, he said, alayhi salatu was salam, ittaqu da'wat al Fear the du'a of the one who is being wronged. Because there is no hijab between that du'a and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There is no veil between that du'a and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wa in kana kafira. Even if it's a kafir, even if it's a disbeliever calling upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There is no veil between that du'a and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah Azawajal has established that He hates the unjust. So just as He said He loves the just, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hates the unjust. Rasulullah says that there are four people that Allah hates. This hadith is in the Nasa'i from Abu Hurairah, it's authentic. Rasulullah says, Al Bayyar al Halaf, Wal Faqir al Mukhtar, Wal Shaykh al Zani, Wal Imam al Jahir. Four people that Allah hates. The vendor, you know, the salesperson who sells his things by taking oaths. You know, when I was, uh, I was in the Arab world a few years ago, Every year when I go to Jordan, so I went to, if you guys know in Jordan, there's a particular uh, souk called souk al the, the the souk that's only open on Tuesdays, right? And, and subhanAllah, you know, everyone is swearing, Wallahi, it's the best, you know, batikh, you know, it's the best water mountain, the best sandals. There's even a guy who was saying, Yid'an Abu Labirbah. May Allah curse the father of the one who makes a profit off of his goods. So everyone is swearing with their products. And this is what the Prophet is saying. Allah hates these people. They're trying to use Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for dunya gains here. And the second one is the poor man who shows off. It's because faqr, you know, poverty is supposed to humble a person to come back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the third one, a shaykh al-zani, not the scholar who commits zina, an old man that commits adultery. Because his desires are not like a young man anymore. So when he commits adultery, even in that age, and the fourth one, is the Imam who is unjust. The Prophet ﷺ also said, ثَلَاثَةٌ لَا يُكَلِّمُهُمُ اللَّهُ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ وَلَا يَنْظُرُ إِلَيْهِمْ وَلَا يُزَكِيهِمْ وَلَهُمْ عَذَابٌ أَلِيمٌ That there are people on the Day of Judgment Allah will not speak to, Allah will not look at, and Allah will not purify them. And for them is a great torment. And the Prophet ﷺ mentioned, as sultan al-jahir, 
And lastly, the Prophet وسلم, he said, Inna Allah la yumni hatta ila akhadahu lam yuflitu. That verily Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He gives respite to the oppressor until He seizes him, He never releases him. And so what Imam al Nawi rahimahullah says about that hadith, he says that you know an oppressor thinks he acquires a lot. But then as soon as Allah seizes him, everything that he's acquired is destroyed by all of the dua that was made against him. His humiliation that comes at the time of his death. And Imam bin Tamir rahimahullah said, sometimes Allah allows the dhalim to live a long life so that the hatred of the people can grow towards that person and he dies without anyone caring about him. SubhanAllah, think about you know, the transgressors, the oppressors. They die when no one cares about them. I'm not going to say any particular names, of, but I remember a few uh, years ago, uh, when one king passed away in the Middle East, they actually, you know, no one cared. People were happy that he was dead. So you know what they did? They actually had people in the streets, they were pointing guns at them and telling them to cry while the cameras were on them. And they were threatening to kill them if they don't cry for the cameras. How pitiful is that? No one cries for you whenever you pass away. Allah Azza wa Jalla describes Fir'aun and his people, كَمْ تَرَكُوا مِنْ جَنَّاتٍ وَعْيُونَ وَزُرُوعٍ وَمَقَامٍ كَرِيمٍ وَنِعْمَةٍ كَانُوا فِيهَا فَاكِهِينَ كَذَلِكَ وَأَوْرَثْنَاهَا أَوْرَثْنَاهَا قَوْمًا آخِرِينَ فَمَا بَكَتْ عَلِيهِمُ السَّمَاءُ وَالْأَرْضُ وَمَا كَانُوا مُنْظَرِينَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, how many palaces did they leave behind? How many gardens? How much wealth did they leave behind? And just as Allah sees them, you know, it was another group of people inherited it, and not a single creation of Allah in the heavens, nor on the earth, nor the heavens or the earth themselves shed a tear for them. وَمَا كَانُوا مُنْظَرِينَ Nor are they granted respite from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, and that is obviously a very humiliating uh, death. Rasulullah also said, You know, the Prophet said, Shafa'ati, my intercession is for the major sinners of my ummah. But in this hadith, which is authentic, the Prophet said, Except for two. Sinfani min ummati la tanalahuma shafa'ati. The Prophet said, There are two people on the Day of Judgment that my intercession will not benefit. Imam ظَلُومٌ غَشُومٌ Prophet said, an Imam, a ruler. Now by the way, when you say Imam, we're not just talking about Imam who leads Salah. And we're going to talk about how this isn't just referring to the Khalifa, it refers to anyone who's an Imam in his capacity, whether it's in your home, or a teacher, or whatever it may be. Someone who has the authority of someone else. So an Imam that transgressed and cheated his people and the Prophet says, And again, it goes back to someone who, who cheats in his trade. And, you know, so subhanAllah, that is that is the hatred that Allah Azza wa has towards that person. And Imam Ibn Hajar rahimahullah, he says, <laughs> He says that you go to sleep and the eye of the one that you've wronged is wide open. Meaning what? Sometimes you wrong someone and you got away with it. But his eye is wide open and he's making dua against you. And the eye of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala never shuts. So you should be very careful with not wronging anyone. And the Prophet also said, Afdalul uh, Jihad, Kalimatu Haq, or Kalimatu Adh, depending on the narration, Ainda Sultan and Ja'ad, the best jihad, the best form of striving is saying a word of truth to an unjust ruler. We see from the Prophet ﷺ, obviously, that he is the ultimate man of Adil, the ultimate, the ultimate Imam of Adil is the Prophet ﷺ. And we find, you know, subhanAllah, just to show you the extent to which the Prophet ﷺ feared injustice. Usayd ibn Hudayr, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he narrates that a man from the Ansar, and this is narrated in Abu Dawood, we said it in Sahih, it's an authentic hadith, he said that a man from the Ansar was joking with his friends. And obviously, you know, he was laughing obnoxiously. So he says the Prophet ﷺ, he poked him under his ribs. You know, meaning just to, he's a young man, a youth, to calm down, you know, because he was laughing out of control. So the Prophet ﷺ was telling him to calm down. Other narrations indicate, by the way, this was even in time of battle. So to calm down, to get serious. The man responded to the Prophet ﷺ, and he said to the Prophet ﷺ, meaning what? I want my revenge. Can you imagine you're saying this to the Prophet ﷺ, a youth? Saying that to the Prophet ﷺ, I want my revenge. So the Prophet ﷺ immediately, he stood, he handed him the stick and he said, Islamah, take your revenge. And listen to what this young man says. He says to the Prophet ﷺ, Inna alayka qamis and walaysa alayka qamis. You're wearing a shirt and I wasn't wearing a shirt, meaning you struck me under my shirt. 
So he says the Prophet ﷺ even raised his shirt, he raised his garment, alayhi salatu wasalam. Imagine, you know, who would expect that of the Prophet ﷺ? And the Prophet ﷺ, he told him, go ahead. He said, go ahead and, and take your revenge. And he didn't say it angrily, he said, take your revenge. So, you know, the man, the young man, he grabbed the Prophet ﷺ and he kissed his rib. And he said, ma aratu, inna ma aratu hada ya Rasulullah. All I wanted was this, O Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The point is, again, look at the character of the Prophet ﷺ, how much he feared dhulm. Ibn Abbas عنه, he says, it's even with the small things that the Prophet ﷺ feared dhulm. Uh, Ibn Abbas عنه, he says that one time we were sitting, the Prophet ﷺ, and I was on his right, and he was about 10 years old, and Abu Bakr and Umar on his left. So the Prophet ﷺ had a bowl of milk. Now the sunnah is to first serve the one on your right, but think about this, you have a shaykhan, you have the two scholars of Islam next to the Prophet ﷺ, old men, next to the Prophet ﷺ, you have a 10 year old kid. So he said the Prophet ﷺ drunk, and then he said to Ibn Abbas he says, He said, do you mind, you know, do I have your permission? He's saying to a 10 year old boy, do I have your permission, Ya Abdullah, to give them some milk before you? So Ibn Abbas he's smart. He says to the Prophet ﷺ, he says, Ya Rasulullah, I want the barakah, I want the blessings of drinking from the milk right after you. <laughs> so he took his right, the Prophet ﷺ gave him his bowl and he drank from the milk right after the Prophet ﷺ. And finally, with the Prophet ﷺ, a hadith that's narrated by Al-Babawi, Shaykh al-Sunnah, that the Prophet ﷺ, you know, a lot of times the leaders of Quraysh, they used to come to the Prophet ﷺ and they used to say, just do away with these people around you, right? We don't want the Ibn Mas'uds and the Bilaz and these poor people around you. So one time they said, we will not enter if Ibn Mas'ud is there. And the Prophet ﷺ said, why do you think Allah sent me? Why do you think Allah sent me? And he said, verily Allah does not bless a people amongst whom a weak man is not given his right. So we find even early on the Prophet ﷺ stood for justice before he became a Nabi. He was the youngest person that took place. He was only in his 20s and 30s whenever he took place in Hidf al which was the League of the Just, the pact established amongst Quraysh. He was the youngest man there, alayhi salatu wasalam, and he constantly stood for it. Uthman bin Affan radiallahu ta'ala anhu, we also see, subhanAllah, when he was 85 years old, he pinched the ear of a young boy. And he saw that the young boy was annoyed. So Uthman radiallahu anhu, he said, pinch my ear. And the young boy said, Ya Amir al I don't want to pinch your ear. You know, subhanAllah, it's, he's, he's maybe seven years older than him. I don't want to pinch your ear. Uthman radiallahu ta'ala anhu said, pinch, and he insisted until the boy took his ear. And Uthman radiallahu anhu said, pinch harder. He said, pinch harder, because the, the, the revenge of this world is so much lighter than the revenge of the hereafter. So retaliate now so that I don't have to face it in the hereafter. Now again, we're not just talking about khulafa. Everyone acts in his own capacity. So Rasulullah said, Kullukum ra'in wa kullukum mas'ulun an ra'iyyati. Every single one of you is a shepherd. And every single one of you is responsible for his flock. So Imam bin Hajar rahimahullah, he says, Al ab imam an ala awlami. You know, that the, the, the father is the imam for his children. You know, the, the, the woman is the imam for her home. That the teacher is the imam of his students. That the, the employer is the imam of his employees. So the leader, you're in charge of them. That's the point. You have authority over some of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's creation. What do you do as a result of that? So we see the Prophet ﷺ address justice between your children. Rasulullah ﷺ says, Allah, fear Allah wa and, and be just with your children. Nu'man al-Bashir says, One time my father was going to give me a gift. And the Prophet ﷺ, he stopped him before he could give me the gift, and he was a young boy. And Rasulullah ﷺ said, did you give a gift to his siblings as well? And his father said, no. And the Prophet ﷺ, he says, لا أشهد على زور. He says, I'm not going to bear witness to falsehood. The Prophet ﷺ got up and he left. He even considered that dhulm that a father gives one of his children a gift with, without giving the other children a gift as well. And he said, you know, even when he was talking about the one who has a daughter, you know, those of us who have daughters, we like to read the hadith about raising a daughter and being protected from hellfire. One of the hadith in Bukhari, وَلَمْ يُفَضِّلْ وَلَا لَهُ عَلَيْهَا He doesn't prefer his boys to his girls. 
That's dhulm. It's a form of transgression as well. So the Prophet ﷺ addressed it with your children. The Prophet ﷺ even addressed it with the animals. That a woman goes to hellfire because she does, you know, because she locks a cat into a cage. And that a man, you know, gets to Jannah because he gives water to a thirsty dog. Umar al Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu, when he was Khalifa, he cried one time. And they said, Why are you crying? He said, Because I fear that on the day of judgment, the donkey in Iraq will testify against me because its owner overburdened it. And that's my responsibility. So even with the animals, and subhanAllah, we find that as we said, Imam al Adil benefits the entire uh, creation. Rasulullah mentioned that when the time of Isa alayhi salam comes, when Isa alayhi salam comes back, and again, he's coming back as a just ruler, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, he said that a snake would not bite a person, and a wolf would not attack a flock of sheep. Why is that? SubhanAllah. And Adi ibn Hatim radiallahu alayhi, he says one time the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam asked him, have you seen this area in Iraq? And, and Adi said, no, but I've heard of it. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam said, if you live long enough, You'll see a woman departing alone by camel, fearing no one but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from Yemen to that region in Iraq. And Adi ibn Hatim, he said, you know, she wouldn't fear anyone but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. She doesn't fear the animals at night. She doesn't fear robbers. She fears no one. And he said, I saw that in the time of Umar ibn Abdul Aziz rahimahullah ta'ala. When Umar ibn Abdul Aziz rahimahullah became Khalifa, Malik ibn Dinar rahimahullah says, the moment that Umar took the bay'ah to become Khalifa, he took the allegiance to become Khalifa, he was such a just man that the wolves no longer would attack any flock of sheep. Not a single flock of sheep was attacked by a wolf under Umar ibn Abdul Aziz. And the shepherds knew the day that Umar was killed, or Umar died, whenever the wolves started to attack the sheep again. So when the Imam is just, if his justice is enough, even the animals and the insects will become just as well, and of course there's economic injustice as well, so the Prophet ﷺ mentioned paying the laborer before his sweat dries. We already talked about uh, last week the one who's buried under the surfaces of the earth because, or the surfaces of an ard al the place of assembly, because of his injustice, being easy with people's debts, when people owe you money, and we'll talk about that, that's actually a category of those that are shaded that the Prophet ﷺ mentioned, so economic injustice as well. Even injustice in sadaqah is condemned. You might be thinking to yourself, how can you be dhalim with your charity? How can you be unjust with your charity? Rasulullah said an authentic hadith from Anas ibn Malik ta'ala That the one who, who is unjust in his giving of charity is like the one who withholds it. What does that mean? When there is favoritism in your charity, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't accept that sadaqah because it's erasing a dhulm, it's erasing a transgression in one way by helping someone. But at the same time, if you're forbidding someone who's more deserving of that, if you're playing favorites with your charity, it's not accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, you know, being a just person gives you success and safety in both ways. And to end this category, I'll just mention to you guys a story about Umar bin Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu. You know, Umar radiallahu anhu, his whole seerah is justice. He is a man of justice, radiallahu anhu. Whether it was with a slave over a master, whether it was with a non-Arab over an Arab, whatever it is, Umar radiallahu anhu did not allow injustice to anything under his rule. And Hurmuzan, who was the, the emperor of Persia, he came to Medina and he asked to see Umar al-Khattab. And the Persians were known for being very pompous, right? They had, you know, when you, when you see Al-Bayt al-Abyam, the White House in Hadith literature, it's Bayt al-Kisra. It's the house of Kisra. You know, some people, they quote these ahadith like Rasulullah said that you're going to conquer the White House. Like, wait, the hadith is sahih. <laughs> but Rasulullah says, Baytu Kisra, or Ali Kisra. It's the house of Kisra or the family of Kisra because Kisra, the, 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 the rulers in Persia had huge white palaces. So Hurmuzan comes to Medina and he says, Where is Umar al Khattab, Amir al Mu'mineen, the most powerful man in the world? So they take him. And they say he's either in the masjid or he's in his home. He goes to the masjid, he's not there. He goes to his home. It's a little mud hut and he's shocked. Then he's, you know, he sees this long man. Now Umar radiallahu anhu was a huge man sleeping out in the open under a tree on his shoes and his sword is hanging from the tree with no bodyguards. Can you imagine the most powerful man in the world? 
not having any bodyguards, sleeping out in the middle. Think about any head of state in the world right now, sleeping out in the open, what would happen to them if they didn't have their bodyguards even for one moment? Umar ibn al-Khattab who has his sword hanging on the tree. Someone can just go grab the sword and stab him. And he's sleeping on his shoes. Hurmuzan walks up and he says beautiful lines of poetry. He says, Hakamta fa'adalta fa'aminta fa'nimta. You ruled and you ruled with justice. Meaning what? You were able to sleep like this because you gave everyone their rights. Fa'aminta fa'nimta. So you were secure and you were able to sleep without anyone bothering you. So justice gives you safety in both worlds. The second category is what Rasulullah says, Shabu nasha'a fi ibadatillah. A young person who grew up in the worship of Allah. Now by the way, keep in mind, Ibn Hajar rahimahullah, he said that all of the categories here apply to men and women. It's not just men. So the word man in the Arabic language, Shab, also means a woman as well, a young woman as well. So a young person, that grew up in the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah Azza wa Jalla says in Surah Al-Kahf, إِنَّهُمْ فِتْيَةٌ آمَنُوا بِرَبِّهِمْ وَزِدْنَاهُمْ هُدَىٰ The only detail Allah chose to give, give us about the people of Al-Kahf, the people of the cave, are that they were a, a group of young people. Allah didn't give us their number, He didn't give us their nationality. Allah said they were youth that took to a cave to protect their faith. Okay? Allah Azza wa Jalla wants us to understand this was a group of young people. Now the word nasha'a, shabun nasha'a, it means a young person that was nourished and energized with the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Meaning what? While other youth were filling their heads with absolute nonsense, they were filling their heads with the Qur'an. They were filling their heads with knowledge. They were filling their heads with that which is good for them. While other youth were wasting their time, you know, in, 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 you know, in, in doing useless things, they were serving Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with their, with their youth, with their energy, with their health. And just think about this. I always tell young people here, especially in a privileged society, think about the priorities of an 18 year old here in America, in Plano in particular, compared to the priorities of an 18 year old in Syria. Priorities completely shift in accordance with your circumstances. So, Shabun, a young person who takes advantage of their youth. And the Rasulullah says, one of the things that you will be asked about on the Day of Judgment. عَنْ عُمْرِهِ فِي مَا أَثْنَى About your, your age, the years that Allah gave you, how did you use those, ear, those years? So Allah Azza wa wants to see how you use these, these years. And Allah, Rasulullah also told us in the hadith of khamsa qabla khams, take advantage of five before five. Your health, your free time, and your youth usually come along your young age, right? Because you get busier when you get older, you get less healthy when you get older, and of course you get older when you get older, closer to death when you get older. So all of those five categories really do, in a way, relate to taking advantage of your youth, taking advantage of your years when you are young, serving Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's a tragedy and a travesty that people don't get serious about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala usually until they're past their prime, their Islamic prime. That's when they get serious about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that matters because Rasulullah said in the hadith in Al Bukhari from Abu Hurairah, he said, And hatta balagha sittin min umri in another narration, Allah will continue to forgive a person until they become 60 years old. It's a hadith in Bukhari. Now, that's the general rule. Doesn't it? Why is that? What is the sharh of this hadith, the explanation of this hadith? The older you get, the more you should have learned your lessons. So if you commit haram at an older age, it means you still haven't learned your lesson. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, especially when it comes to young people, wants a person to take advantage of their youth. Now what's considered young in sharia? Here's the question, what's considered young in sharia? Right? Are we talking about a child here? What is a shah? So the ulama, they use two ahadith and ayat to, to, to come to this conclusion. Number one, the hadith of Nafi' from Ibn Umar radiallahu anhu, which is in a tirmidhi that he says that Rasulullah Ibn Umar says, the Prophet turned me away from the army at the age of 14 years old. And then he says, I was, you know, I, I came back at the age of 15 and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he accepted me. And Umar ibn Abdul Aziz rahimahullah, he commented on the hadith from Ibn Umar. Ibn Umar is his uncle. He said, هَذَا حَدُّ مَا بَيْنَ الصَّغِيرِ وَالْكَبِيرِ 15 years old is the limit between youth, I mean, being a child and then becoming a shah. 
right? Becoming a young person as described here. And the Prophet ﷺ used to do, you know, once a person turned 15, the Prophet ﷺ gave them a salary from Baytul Mad, right? He, he included them as adults at that point. So they said, Shah starts either when he becomes badith, when he becomes, when he hits puberty, or when he becomes 15 years old. One doesn't end. What do you guys think? 44. At the age of 40 years old. So those of you that are in your 30s, alhamdulillah, we can still feel young, right? Still, alhamdulillah, we still are, are, are praiseworthy. We still have a chance here. If you're under 40 years old, you still have a chance. You're still considered shad. Why? Because Allah Azza wa says, "Hatta ida balaga ashudda wa balaga arba'in sana." Surah Al-Ahqaf. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says, "Until he reaches his maturity, and then he reaches 40 years old." So shad is the time between 50 and 40, and we see the attitude of the Sahaba. It's no secret. When you look at the Sahaba of the Prophet the vast majority of them were Shabab, were young people. The Ansar that took bay'ah to the Prophet only three of them were older than 40 years old. Three of the Ansar were over 40. The rest of them were all young people. They were all youth. Six of the Ashab Mubashireen, six of the 10 Promised Paradise, were under the age of 19 when they became Muslim. Okay? And you study them one by one. They were teenagers that were accepting the message of the Prophet ﷺ and serving the deen. The people like Ali radiallahu anhu at the age of nine, uh, Al Abadina, Abdullah ibn Abbas, Abdullah ibn Umar, Abdullah ibn Zubayr, these young Abdullahs around the Prophet ﷺ in their teenage years, uh, even younger than that, Abdullah ibn Abbas shadowed the Prophet ﷺ from his age of 10 to 13 when the Prophet ﷺ died. Young people. And in fact, subhanAllah, we see the attitude. Abdullah ibn Amr al-As who was only 15 years old. Here is what Amr ibn As complained to the Prophet about Abdullah ibn Amr al-As. He said, my son reads too much Qur'an, he prays too much at night, and he fasts too much. How many of you have kids in here? How many of you would love to be able to come to the Shaykh and say, Shaykh, talk to my son. He reads too much Qur'an. He prays too much at night. He doesn't sleep at night. All he does is fast and pray and read Quran. <laughs> so Abdullah was brought to the Prophet ﷺ on a complaint from his father that he does too much. So Rasulullah ﷺ told him, how much do you pray at night? He said, I pray all night. Rasulullah ﷺ told him, no, the best qiyam, the best prayer at night is the qiyam of Dawood ﷺ. Sleep the first two thirds, wake up for the last third, pray, and then sleep at the last sixth. And he responded to the Prophet Sallallahu he says, and this is where, what I really want to get to, he says, دعني أستمتع من قوتي وشبابي. He said, Ya Rasulullah, leave me to, to, to uh, دعني أستمتع means, allow me to taste the pleasure of my strength and my age, my youth. This was his mata'ah, this is his pleasure, you know, let me taste the pleasure of being young and energetic, meaning I can do this now. The Prophet ﷺ said, no. How much do you fast? Every day. The Prophet ﷺ told him, Mondays and Thursdays, he said, Ya Rasulullah, da'ni astamti'ah, let me do more. No, you know, fine, you can do the three days of a month. He says, Ya Rasulullah, more. The Prophet ﷺ finally told him, you can fast every other day, like the Qiyam of Dawood a.s. وَهَذَا يَكْفِي That's enough. Ya Rasulullah, I can do more? No. How much do you read Qur'an? Every single day he was finishing a khitmah. Every day, this teenager was finishing the Qur'an. The Prophet ﷺ told him, you finish it once a week, once every seven, uh, seven days. He said, Ya Rasulullah, I can do more. The Prophet ﷺ told him, no. Now the Prophet ﷺ allowed some Sahaba to do so, but the Prophet ﷺ was calming him down because this is what young people around the Prophet ﷺ wanted to do. They were enthusiastic about the deen. They were overzealous about the religion. They wanted to do more and more and more. And the Prophet ﷺ didn't have to tell them, you know, hey, stop doing this and stop doing that. The Prophet ﷺ used to have to tell them, calm down. And so we see the hadith of Jundub ibn Abdullah radiallahu ta'ala anhu, where he says, Kunna ma'a Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, wa nahnu fityanun hazawiratun, fata'allamna al-imana qabla an ta'allam, anna ta'allamna al-Qur'an, thumma ta'allamna al-Qur'ana, fazdadna bihi imana. He says, we were strong young people around the Prophet ﷺ. We were young people around the Prophet ﷺ with strength. So he said, we learned Iman, and then we learned Qur'an, and then with the Qur'an, our Iman increased. So they were learning from the Prophet ﷺ consistently and dedicating themselves. Even Umar ibn al-Khattab even Umar, the Prophet ﷺ describes him, because 
you know that whole story of Umar going to the house of his sister, and you think of a really old grown man, he was 24 years old. The whole story of him going to the house and finding his sister reading Qur'an and all that, you know, going to the Prophet and when he becomes Muslim, as Ibn Mas'ud says, the Islam of Umar was victory, it was Nusra for the deen. And taking all of the companions out behind him and declaring La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah and the respect that he had amongst his people. He was 24 years old. And the Prophet says in the authentic hadith from Anas radiallahu Jannah. He said, I entered into Jannah. He said, So I found myself in a palace of gold. He said, I asked the angels, Who is this palace for? They said, for a young man, a youth from Quraysh. So Rasulullah says, فَذَرَنْتُ فَذَرَنْتُ أَنِّي أَنَا هُوَ He said, I thought that I was him. فَقُلْتُ وَمَنْ, ومن هُوَ Who is that man? فَقَالُوا عُمَرْ بِنْ الْخَطَّةِ They said, it's Umar bin Khattab. So Umar bin Khattab was a youth in the time of the Prophet وسلم, And of course, the best of the Shabab. Uh, Rasulullah said in the hadith in Bukhari, Al Hassan al Hussein, Sayyida Shabari Ahl al Jannah, that Al Hassan and Hussein will be the chiefs of the youth of paradise, wa abuhuma khayru minhuma, and their father is better than them because Ali and his two sons, Al Hassan and Hussein, from a very early age, they took hold of the deen, and it was a youth movement. Umar ibn Abdul Aziz became the governor of Medina at the age of 25 years old, Khalifa at the age of 38 died before the age of 40. Al-Bukhari compiled Sahih al-Bukhari at the age of 21 years old. He started Bukhari. And Imam al-Nawi rahimahullah ta'ala died at the age of 40 or 39, never even got married. And Imam bin Taymiyyah never got married. A shafii you know, already memorized the Qur'an and the Muwatta of Malik at the age of seven, became a mufti at the age of 12. You know, you can go through all of these statements and what you find is that again, that the, the young people were always the root of this deen. They were always the best of this deen. They were the ones that carried the torch of this deen. And so especially the young people that are watching here, Alhamdulillah, I'm optimistic. I really am. You know, I'm finished with this tonight. I'm optimistic because Alhamdulillah, those that are tuning in, those that are at the conferences, the classes, those that are volunteering, are young people. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Allah Azza wa allows the youth to recognize their role in this religion once again and to busy themselves with that which is good and be protected from the shaitan and all the temptations as a result. Allahumma ameen. Jazakumullah khairan to all of you for tuning in and for all of you for attending.